everybody. Welcome to Crashing Your Planet, brought to you by Spark and Fizz. This is Jake McKelvey, and thank you so much for listening. This is this is episode number six. C-Y-P-E-O-6. Look at how far we've come, you guys. This is amazing. Today I'm, I'm talking with Josh Cantor, who is the organ player at Fenway Park for the Boston Red Sox. Did you hear that? The Boston Red Sox. Isn't that cool? He also plays in uh, a handful of bands. He plays in the Baseball Project. He plays in Jim's Big Ego. He plays in the Split Squad. He has done uh, music for The Best Show with Tom Sharpling. He's a, he's a studio musician. He's done some touring. I first uh, you know, started to become familiar with him a few months ago, a couple months ago. I, I saw Josh sitting in with the drive-by truckers at a show in Providence. He came out uh, every you know, every so often and, and would sit in on some songs on, on the, the organ. And uh, they introduced him as, as being the, the organ player at the Red Sox games. And, and then just a couple of weeks after that, I saw Josh. I was at another show in Boston seeing Eric Bachman at the Lizard Lounge. And, and Josh just kind of strolled in about halfway through the show. And, and at that point, as I, I say to Josh uh, at some point in our conversation, that's when I, I decided that I wanted to reach out to him and see if he'd be interested in, in talking with me because I, I felt like we had some some things in common. So so he agreed to talk with me, and I'm, I'm really glad that he did. Uh, you can follow Josh on Twitter and on Instagram at JT Cantor. That's J-T-K-A-N-T-O-R. Uh, one really cool thing is if uh, if you go to a Red Sox game, you can tweet at Josh during the game and, and request songs for him to play on the organ. And he'll he'll play, you know, I'm, I'm not going to say he'll play everything, but he'll he'll do his best to accommodate your request. So so that's I think that's a really neat kind of Easter egg uh, to know about if you're ever at a at a Red Sox game. Lastly, real quick, uh, this is the, the bi-weekly reminder to please review the show on iTunes if you have the chance and the ability to do so. If you don't, maybe consider uh, sharing a link to this episode or to your favorite episode so far on Facebook or on Twitter or, or what have you. Uh, just you know, trying to help get the word out about the show. It goes a long way. We, we appreciate it. Uh, we're going to play a couple of songs in this episode, as we have been doing of late. Josh sent me a couple tracks that he was involved with that, that we could play. So the first one we're going to hear going into this conversation is entitled, I'll, I'll read verbatim what Josh sent me in this email. He said, the song's called Panda and the Freak. He, he didn't say this song's called Panda and the Freak. That, that part wasn't verbatim. He just said, Panda and the Freak. And then this is what he said. This is a hidden track on the Baseball Project's third LP, aptly titled Third. It's an organ instrumental cover that I did of a song that was on the Baseball Project's second LP. So please enjoy Panda and the Freak. And then at the tail end of the show, we're going to play you another song off of one of the Jim's Big Ego records that Josh played on. So thank you so much. I hope you enjoy the conversation. I'll see you a little bit after. So this is an interesting one, I guess. Uh, typically, I've been talking to like, you know, more kind of touring, like indie musician type of people. Which, uh-huh. um, I, I guess you you might fall into that category to some degree, but you're uh, you also don't <laughs> in in another. So, um, so I guess I'll start off by asking you. Um, so there's no Red Sox game tonight, right? There's no Red Sox home game tonight. So what do you what do you do on your your off nights typically? Do you gig uh, around? Well, uh, yeah, I mean I am a uh, you know to your earlier point. I mean I am a 
a touring musician and a you know with some indie outfits i guess kind of like when time allows um mm. so so when the red sox have a home game i'm at fenway park which is roughly 13 nights a month for six months and when they don't have home games when it's the off season or a night off or they're on a road trip like they are currently um then i don't uh <laughs> then i don't go to the ballpark i i do other things i do as much music stuff as I can do, um, recording sessions, um, playing club shows with, uh, bands that I enjoy playing with. Um, or sometimes I might just curl up with a good book on a, on a, <laughs> on a given night. Mm-hmm. Uh, h- how long have you been doing the Red Sox thing? This is my 14th season with them. Oh, wow. Okay. Do you want to, I don't know if this is a, an annoying question you answer constantly, but, um, how did you, how did you get that gig? Um, I think it was, uh, a combination of, I mean, you know, I had some base level qualifications in terms of like being a, you know, being a, a a decent organ player and, and knowing and understanding baseball. Uh, and then also there was luck involved, lucky timing. I was in the right place at the right time. Um, I knew someone who was working for the team at the time and he was sort of familiar with me. Um, so he had recommended me to their audition committee, which kind of helped me get a foot in the door. And I went in for a couple of rounds of auditions. Um, I seem to remember the first audition going okay, but not great. And then I seem to remember the second audition going really well. And they just kind of put me through the paces, tested me on a lot of, things regarding my knowledge of different genres and eras of popular music and my knowledge of baseball. Um, And at the end of the second audition, they offered me the job and I was super excited to take it. I mean, I think maybe partly I'd gotten that recommendation because I think that that person who I knew, he, um, you know, he probably knew, I mean, I had sort of told people offhand for years, like, man, that would probably be the coolest job in the world to, to play organ at a baseball game, you know, for somebody like me who loves playing organ and who loves, um, watching baseball. And I had had, you know, I'd played with a lot of bands and I'd played in a lot of like, uh, uh, musical theater orchestra pits. Um, I think probably the music experience that had best prepared me for that was, um, for a long time, I was, a a piano and organ, uh, live accompanist for a for a theater group that was all that did all improvisational theater. So it was the kind of thing where you had these actors on the stage and things would happen and you never knew what was going to happen at any given moment and you had to be prepared with a musical cue, you know, spontaneously. Um, yep. And that's very similar, I think, to the baseball games because you don't know, you know, there's you kind of have a sense of any number of things that might happen, but you don't really know what's going to happen until it happens. And then you have to be, um, ready to play the right music at the right time. So that was that, that particular style of theater was, was really good training for it. I think. I'm assuming you go into any game, I guess I'm not assuming this, but do you go into any game with like, you know, you probably have, you know, your, some of your standard tunes in rotation that you're playing most nights, um, like maybe certain songs that uh, accommodate specific types of situations. Yeah, I mean, I think the the um, you know the only thing that's really scripted is um, playing "Take Me Out to the Ball Game" during the seventh inning stretch, and that's one that I do every single night. Um, and so I've done it, you know, a million times. Um, but it's one that I haven't gotten sick of because it's because it's really fun when a whole giant stadium full of people all stand up and sing along with you playing, you know, you sort of get a, a neat little charge out of that. As far as other songs at other times, um, I try to mix it up as much as possible just for my own, um, I don't know, I guess edification, but also just for, you know, for people who come regularly, um, to not have to kind of subject them to the same stuff night after night. Um, when I first started and I was not experienced with it and I was nervous and I was, you know, trying to be as prepared as possible, I did sort of jot down all these different lists. You know, I had these handwritten lists that were like, well, in the following situations, here's a list of songs to consider. And in the following And in these types of situations, here's another list of songs to consider. And just as time has gone on and as I've gotten more comfortable, um, I've learned a lot about sort of which of those songs work and which ones don't. And I've committed the list 
to memory or at least sufficiently to memory. I mean, I've sort of forgotten a lot of them probably, but then I'll always learn new ones and, um, along the way. And, uh, I get a lot of great requests from people, um, who will stop by during the game and say hello, or will send me requests on Twitter and say, Hey, you know, here's a great, here's a cool song idea for a certain situation. And, and if I like it, um, I'll try it. And a lot of times people think of great stuff that I would have never come up with, um, on my own. So that kind of interactivity is really fun. And I think for people who are sending in the suggestions, it's fun for them too. Um, and it's also very much a collaborative effort between uh, the DJ and myself. So the DJ plays all the recorded music and we talk to each other via headset all throughout, you know, before the game, during batting practice and pregame ceremonies and, and throughout during the game. And then even after the game, as we're playing the music to kind of wind down as people are heading out, uh, at the end of the night. And we're constantly talking to each other, giving each other cues, suggestions, feedback, making sure we both don't play at the same time, obviously. Um, and, uh, but we really keep each other on our toes and it's great to have, um, kind of a teammate and a collaborator to help me with that so that it's not just a solo endeavor. Um, and he also comes from a background of having, um, been a DJ for improvisational theater. So we have a lot of kind of shorthand between us from that world that helps us communicate kind of quickly and effectively um, and helps us both kind of be of the mindset that like, you know, my job is to make him sound good and his job is to make me sound good. Um, and uh, so it's a real team in that regard. And that is, um, I don't know, that's really special to me. I, I really cherish that. When you, when you get the requests from people, are you – the songs that you're playing, do you know how to play all of these songs or do you have some kind of cheat music, like cheat sheet kind of thing going no, on? No, I mean it's – I mean it varies. Um, I often don't know how to play the songs and I don't have, you know, sheet music readily available and I'm not really good at reading sheet music anyway, which I mean, on one hand, I wish I was better at it. But at the same time, this particular job doesn't really call for it. If you have good ear and good memory, that's kind of the fastest way to, to pull this stuff up, I think. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I'll get I mean, I get requests for all kinds of stuff, you know, across the board and across the spectrum. And if it's something that I'm familiar with, then, you know, I can either bust it out immediately or, you know, whip it up pretty quickly. I can just, you know, like play through my earpiece, not out to the stadium, just run through the chorus real fast in a few seconds, make sure I remember the song and then say, OK, I'm good to go. And then I can play it live in the park. If it's a song that I'm less familiar with, um, I may need to kind of run it in my head and it may take a minute or two to, to pull it together. If it's a song that I'm really not familiar with, maybe I've never heard it before or I haven't heard it in 30 years or whatever. Um, in those instances, uh, usually what I'll try to do is like, you know, pull up a YouTube version of it on my phone, listen to that, um, and then try to play it back as best as possible. And that's something that, um, that's a skill that I just have kind of cultivated over many, many years of playing is just sort of being able to, um, mimic, you know, at least to kind of mimic the, the hooks and the choruses and the key sections of the, you know, melody and the, and the accompaniment that are going to get people to recognize the song and, and, uh, and be able to know like, Oh, that's, yeah, I know that song. Yeah. Wow. That, that's, that's incredible. I felt reasonably certain, you know, I, I, when I'm on Twitter, like I, I see those requests coming in all the time and I, I see you responding to them and I've yeah. just always had the assumption, like he must have just some vast, you know, database sheet music access or something it's that's wild that you're able to do that it's really cool thanks i appreciate it um oh yeah i mean as as someone who i mean i'm i'm a musician but i don't i don't have any of that sort of skill really and that's really that's really incredible um and what what first sort of you know caught me about about your you know position as the Red Sox organist, because I really, I didn't, you know, I didn't know who you were until you know, two months or so ago. Uh, my dad and I went to Providence to see the drive by truckers 
and uh, you wandered on stage every so often to accompany them. Right. And uh, and then they had announced who you were. Yeah. And and my dad and I thought that was incredibly cool. Um, and then I shortly after that just kind of started following you on Twitter, and then I sort of realized all of these different worlds that you were immersed in, and you know saw like the the fact that you play these like indie rock songs at the Red Sox games like I think I've seen like super chunk songs or like guided by voices songs like in right. your in your rotation which is a pretty unique kind of thing yeah I suspected it I mean I guess well so I mean you shouldn't feel badly if you if you're like oh I didn't I had no idea who you were because most people you know don't know who I am and I think a lot of people even assume that it's like just a, that it's all, you know, pre-recorded and somebody's just pushing a button or yeah, something. Right. So, I mean, I, I, you know, I like to kind of promote the notion that it's, that it's a live organist and I try to, you know, encourage people to appreciate, um, live organ music at ball games. It's something that was important to me growing up and that, you know, I was mentored by, um, a couple of people who really excelled at it. Um, you know, I've been doing it at Fenway for long enough now that, um, I guess I have, a style that's mine. I mean, if you go to different parks that still, you know, to the 15 or so major league parks that still have a live organist, each one kind of has their own sound and their own style and their own way of doing it. And you try to have it match the sort of overall feel of the, of the venue um, and the, the culture of the fan base and that kind of thing. Um, for me, doing the indie rock stuff. I mean, I try to, you know, represent as many different genres as I possibly can based on Mm -hmm. what people want to hear. Um, The indie rock thing is something that it's a world that I've kind of fallen into in recent years in terms of my own gigs. Um, It's a world that I've always personally been a fan of. Um, So I think maybe some people find me on Twitter, you know, because they're like, oh, hey, that's that guy who like, sits in with the drive by truckers sometimes like, so I'm going to request a drive by truckers song. And, um, so I think, you know, for the most part, like I try to keep the repertoire in the realm of popular, I would say like 90 to 95% of what I play is like stuff that's big hits, either current big hits or big hits from a, you know, previous generation. Sure. Um, but for that remaining five to 10% to be able to play stuff that's off the beaten path, it's not stuff that, the majority of the crowd is going to recognize, but for the small number of people who do recognize it, oftentimes they'll be, you know, they'll be very excited to hear it. Cause I think maybe, um, maybe it is a unique thing to hear, uh, (laughs) a guided by voices song on an, you know, on a organ at a baseball game. Yeah. Yeah, totally. I mean, that's such an awesome niche to be able to fill. I mean, it, it could, it's cool that the Red Sox are still, still doing that because i mean it could easily be just a pre-recorded you know organ s- snippet and, yeah uh, and i it, think and some some ballparks have gone in that direction and i think you know the red sox to their credit um you know it's the oldest stadium in the majors it's 104 years old mm-hmm. um they value the long-standing tradition of the franchise and the building to where they want to include some of those more old fashioned elements um, like live organ, like a lot of other things they do that are, you know, tied to these old fashioned traditions. At the same time, they want to, um, you know, bring it into the present day and give it a contemporary feel. So whether it's something like me being able to use Twitter to take requests live from fans and add that interactivity and that kind of, you know, 21st century social media technology to the proceedings or to be able to like, I don't know, like that new Beyonce album came out a couple of weeks ago and it's totally awesome and I'm totally hooked on it. And so to be able to play some of those songs at the ballpark, like the, the very week that the album came out, that's kind of um, a fun thing for me. Cause I think for a while, this is probably before my time playing, but for a while it was like, um, there was a more kind of tried and true repertoire of standards that most of the organists were playing. Um, and they didn't venture too far from that. But the thing is, if you do, if you don't update that repertoire over a generation, then all of a sudden those songs that maybe were slightly contemporary or marginally contemporary when you started are, are now are no longer. Um, so, you know, I got great advice from Nancy Faust, who was a white Sox organist for 41 years. And she was my all time favorite 
Um, and I definitely remember her, one of the first times I met her telling me like, keep updating, keep learning new songs. It'll totally, um, be worth your while, your while. You'll get great responses from people. And she was somebody who, you know, she started, I think when she was like 23 or something and she was, it was 1970 and she was one of the first organists to play, you know, basically rock music and soul music. And wow. cause everyone else before that was doing, you know, Broadway and Tin Pan Alley and, and sort of yeah. old jazz standards and that kind of thing. So that was very inspirational for me. So if I can continue to kind of play, um, new hits now, you know, I try to mix those in, but also try to, do the old stuff because, you know, popular music, it's a very generational kind of thing. So for, you know, most people identify most closely with the popular music of what, like typically whenever they were maybe teenagers, cause that's when they were really actively, you know, consuming what was new and what was on the charts. So if somebody's there with their grandkids, it's like, you can play the stuff for the kids and then you play something for the, for the grandparents as well. Um, one thing I've learned along the way is like trying to pay attention to, songs that maybe get a second life a generation later either because they are heavily sampled in a new hit or they are you know featured in a a tv show or a movie or a video game or a commercial or something like that because then you can kind of hit two generations with the same stone if you know what i mean yeah yeah that's what's what's an example of something like that um i don't know i'm trying to think uh uh, what is an example? Well, actually, so like one of the one of the Beyonce songs that I played the other day, um, it heavily samples like an Andy Williams hit from the early '60s, which seems maybe like an unlikely source for um, you know, for her to be drawing from, but it worked really well, and um, you know, and I and I referenced that sample very heavily when I was playing her version and somebody, you know, somebody tweeted at me to say like, Hey, that's cool. You played the Beyonce and somebody else tweeted to say like, Hey, that's cool. You played that old Andy Williams song. I forgot oh, about cool. that song. Yeah. That's really neat. Yeah. That's just great. Are, are you, I want to sort of work, I guess, kind of work backwards to go through um, some of these other sort of worlds that you've inhabited. Um, sorry. Are you a Massachusetts native? Uh, I've been in Boston since 1990, which was when I came here to start college. So before that, I had lived uh, a few other places. I went to high school in Chicago, and that was kind of where I first fell in love with um, Nancy Faust and her organ playing with the White Sox. Okay. Um, before that, in grade school, I mostly lived in um, in Athens, Georgia. Um, you know, and that was like in the early 80s. So that was kind of an interesting time to be a you know, a fan of pop music and to be discovering sort of, you know, indie music or alternative or college rock or whatever it was that they were calling it at that time. Cause there were these bands like Pylon and B-52s and REM that were, um, that were part of a really vibrant scene down there. And so I think, I don't know, I was kind of lucky, I guess, to be, I mean, I was too young to go see the shows, but, you know, but those bands were on my radar and I had their cassettes and I listened to them and it, you know, informed, um, my playing and informed kind of my attitude about, um, about wanting to be a musician. So, uh, so that was sort of a cool influence, but I've been in, I've been, I've been here for 26 years now. So it's certainly it's home at this point. And I mean, I fell in love with the Red Sox the day, literally the day I got here, I went to a game and saw them clobber the Yankees and Mike Greenwell had an inside the park grand slam. And I was like, this is, this is my team, you know, yeah. I, I, sign me up. Cool. I don't imagine that you know the drive-by truckers from your your time in Athens in the eighties. Uh, no, I think you know they were they came on my radar after I had left Athens, um, and uh, you know, and then I was a fan of theirs. And then I want to say it was maybe about two years ago that we were on a bill together at a festival, um, and we just hit it off. They just were the sweetest guys and we were having a great time hanging out and so they were like why don't you jump up and play a song with us and one song turned into two songs and two songs turned into six songs and um and then ever since then typically like when we happen to be in the same town at the same time we'll usually jump up on stage and play with them um it can be a little nerve-wracking just because like they're uh well they don't use a set list <laughs> so oh, <okay. laughs> they um so if you're a guest performer with them, you really, you don't know what song's coming next. And yeah. for them, it works great because they all know all their songs inside out. You know, <laughs> yeah. I'm, 
I'm familiar with, you know, I know a bunch of their songs, but there's some songs I don't know. So like on that particular night, you know, they were throwing stuff out where I was like, I don't totally remember this one, but I'm just going <laughs> to like, I'm just going to kind of lay out the first verse and chorus and kind of get a feel and listen and try to figure out and try to craft something, some kind of interesting organ part that I can then play, you know, to build the song going forward. But, um, uh, but it is, I mean, certainly it's a thrill to play with them. They are an incredible live band, you know? Yeah, they they are great. That was my first time seeing them uh, a couple months ago, uh, and I'm I'm glad I was able to go to that show. Um, and you nailed it, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, oh, thank you. you. I appreciate <laughs> yeah. it. No, yeah, that was. Uh... Yeah, I mean, it's a it's a funny thing because, like, for me, I'm not a um, you know, I don't consider myself to be a great writer. I don't consider myself to be much of a singer. You know, I can't. Uh, play guitar. I'm not really much of a front man, but I am comfortable kind of being a background supporting player with all these different bands. The same way that like being at Fenway, I'm very much a background player. You know, the, the focus is with what's happening on the field, but I get to have this small supporting role that's secondary. Um, so I don't know. I've just been really lucky in recent years to kind of, um, make friends with a lot of my favorite bands just from meeting them at festivals I've played at or, um, uh, or, you know, seeing them when they come to town, um, or, you know, invariably, like if I play one of their songs, the word will kind of get back around to them. You know, somebody will, will somebody who's at the game who hears it will contact them or send them a tweet, you know, and say like, yeah. uh, I don't know. I'm trying to think of an example, like, Hey, uh, postal service. Did you know that, that Josh played one of your songs at the game. Um, and then they'll contact me and say like, Hey, thanks for doing that. And then, um, sometimes that turns into, you know, getting to know them and maybe getting to play with them down the road or something. But so I saw, um, a month or so ago, uh, not long after that drive by truckers show, I was at the lizard lounge in Boston or in, Cambridge, I guess, uh, yeah. for the Eric Bachman show there. Oh yeah. And toward the end of the night, I saw you come down the stairs, um, which was the night I, I saw you there. I just seen you at the drive by trucker show. And I was like, all right, this guy, this, <laughs> I, I want to talk to this guy. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, that's nice. No, I mean, I'm, I'm a huge fan of Eric and almost everything that he's uh, well, I mean, everything that I've ever heard from him, not that I know all this stuff, but, um, uh, yeah, he's wonderful. And I was glad to get to go to that. Show. I seem to remember that, like, I missed the first half of the show cause I was, I think I was coming from a recording session or something that I like, I think I had a baseball game and then a recording session. And then I got there late, but, um, but yeah, I was really excited to see him. Um, and I've gotten to know him a little bit through, um, uh kelly hogan who sings with nico case and a bunch of other people um because i'd become friendly with her through various connections and she and i played together a couple of times but um yeah that was awesome to see eric playing in the lizard lounge it's such a cool little room oh yeah i know it's i've seen him a couple times over the years and that was definitely the the most intimate room i've been able to see him in um mm -hmm. which was really really nice um, so how did you, how did you get involved with the best show? Uh, I was a fan for many years and probably I just like kept pestering them <laughs> until they <laughs> finally let me, um, contribute some music. It's just something that, uh, I don't know. I was a fan for a really, really, really long time. Um, and occasionally I would just send them emails to say, I think you guys are awesome. And through that kind of got to know them a little bit. And it's a show that like is a real community among right. the listenership and the fan base and the people who work on the show. It's very, um, I don't know, it's almost like a family in a way. And, uh, and that's a big part of what I like about, I mean, the show itself, just the broadcast is fantastic, but, um, uh, but I really like the community around it. And at some point, um, I'm trying to remember. Well, I had played the theme song to the show on the organ at a ball game once, um, just because someone had asked me to play it or something. And um, and uh, 
and they said, oh, thanks. That was really cool. You know, the, the folks who worked on the show. And so I said, you know, if you ever have need for, <laughs> you know, um, a musician to like help out with anything, because I know in the past they've had bands that have, you know, recorded songs that they've used for different segments on the show and stuff. Um, and then finally, eventually they asked me to, um, to do some scoring for their new, the new web version of the show. Um, so I've provided some various instrumental theme songs that they use on different segments. Um, and I've been a keyboard player on a couple of their, uh, live shows when they've, you know, done the, done the show live in a, in a club or a theater or something. And it's, uh, it's incredibly gratifying. You know, it's like when you get to, when you get to collaborate, even in some small way with, um, writers and musicians and performers whom you have long admired from afar, it's like, you don't take it for granted. You really are kind of regularly reminded how, um, special and unique that is. Yeah. I, I have that same sort of thing. Like I just started this podcast just recently, but already I've mm -hmm. talked to a few different people where I, I'm just like, man, e even if I just get an email from somebody that, you know, I, I look up to, that's, yeah, it's, it's that, just that feeling of like, oh, this, this person acknowledged the, my existence. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, I mean, it's, um, it's inspiring, you know, to, to, feel feel a connection to someone like that and to um and to think like well you know if they can do it if they can build this thing over a period of years you know i've got this crazy creative idea that i want to try too and maybe over some period of years i can build it into something myself you know yeah completely uh it, and it's it's crazy to see how those things do sort of transpire and and how those i don't know how the worlds kind of overlap a little bit um do you know John Solomon at all? I do know John. Yeah. Um, I think probably through the best show was how I first met him, but, um, it turned out that we, you know, we knew a lot of the same um, music and comedy people through our work. Um, and he, uh, you know, and we've hung out a few times and I've contributed songs for his, uh, annual Christmas radio broadcast, which is a kind of a work of genius in and of itself. Yeah. So, um, yeah, he's awesome. I feel lucky to know him. It, it is funny how kind of the longer you do this and the more people you meet, the sort of the smaller the world gets, you know, and yeah. you realize that there's, you know, the, the number of degrees of separation between all the people, at least, you know, among those who are doing, you know, indie rock and indie comedy and maybe to some extent podcasting. It's like, uh, you know, and then for me sort of playing a lot of these different festivals and you end up meeting, you know, there's like whatever, 20 bands on the bill and you kind of meet everybody and you realize like, Oh, I like this person's a friend of so-and-so and I know you through this other thing. And, um, there's a lot of really interesting interconnectedness there. And I've found it also to be a very like friendly and personable environment, you know, where people recognize and identify that like, it's cool to cross pollinate and to collaborate on different projects. And that, to me is very rewarding and stimulating. So I, so I, I like being in that realm. Yeah, completely. Uh, I mean, even on a, on a much smaller scale, um, you know, like sort of the, the plane that I'm operating from as a, as a musician who, you know, s plays a lot of shows on, you know, just on a DIY sort of level mm -hmm. and, and trying to, you know, book tours, um, in, in that way. And just, you know, sort of a in, in the the modern age of just you know Facebook being probably the biggest tool to put together a you know a tour of any kind for for me at least. You know, it's like just sort of realizing you know this person in Indiana knows this person in Pennsylvania that I've met in two completely different you know situations and and you know that the whole that whole scene is so intertwined and just it it never fails to to blow my mind just how how many people really do know each other from within any you know any niche you know regardless of how how big or small yeah well and it's really cool i mean not only that they know each other but that like that 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 connection between each other kind of like inspires them to want to do something together and to want to collaborate and to want to support a scene. You know, a, a, a friend of mine just posted 
on Facebook last night. She's out in Portland, Oregon, and she's like, I'm trying to put together a Northeast tour for my band at the end of the summer. You know, if anybody out there can help, let me know. And like within minutes, she had this whole long <laughs> page of all these people who were saying, you know, well, I know somebody who can get you something in New York. I know somebody who can get you something in Boston. I know somebody who can get you something out in Western Mass, all these things. And it was like, um, I mean, she's still going to have to, you know, work her ass off to like make it all work and pull it all together. But the network of support that was there instantaneously was just like incredible. Yeah, that that's wild. I mean, I've taken to doing that same sort of thing. I mean, just uh, like a week ago, I, I'm plotting a tour for the, the summer. And, yep. you know, at this point, every time I'm doing something like that, I'm like, I'm just going to post this on Facebook and, and you know list my the states i'm looking to go to and just before i even send out any you know any emails blindly to clubs or whatever i'm just going to see if anyone wants to take any of this off of my plate from the get go and you know usually at least one or two things will will happen as a result of that so yeah it's fantastic you know and i and i do it uh to a certain extent um at fenway as well like with some song selection stuff i mean obviously you never know in a game exactly what's going to happen in a given moment. But a lot of times the DJ and I will sort of plan these little theme nights. Um, and then we'll, you know, kind of, uh, what's the word crowdsource, you know, for like song suggestions. So I remember I think it was last year or the year before, maybe that it was, um, we had a game, a home game on the anniversary of the moon landing. And so we said like, Hey, you know, what are, what are some fun songs that you would like to hear about that are connected to, space travel or something. Um, and within minutes we had a long list of really great requests from people and we were able to kind of craft our program around that. Um, and it's fun to be able to do that. And if people, um, enjoy participating in that, then that's great. I mean, I don't, you know, ultimately at the end of the day, it's, it's my job and the DJ's job to come up with the song. So if we get zero responses, then, you know, it's on us um, to do it ourselves and we'll do that if we have to, but if we can engage people, it kind of, uh, you know, it adds an, an extra level of enjoyment, I think for us and for, and for everyone who's, who's participating. Oh yeah. That's, that seems like a total, a total win, uh, all around. I mean, uh, keeping people excited in that way. I mean, you know, since I've started following you on Twitter and everything, I've just been looking forward to the, the next time I can go to a Red Sox game and, and, and tweet at you to request a, some kind of, I don't know. An Eric Bachman song, right? Yeah, 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 exa <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do that, hopefully sometime this year. Cool. So I want to talk a, a little more about your history um because you said you you know you do do some amount of touring and i know you just got back from uh norway was it yeah i just played at a um at an indie rock festival in norway in a little town called eggersund it was brief i was only there for like three or four days that was uh, during the red sox last road trip about a week and a half ago um but it was super fun the guy who put it together uh was a fellow named frode stromstad who's in a a band called I was a King that some people may be familiar with awesome mm -hmm. pop band. And, um, uh, it's his hometown and he just kind of like invited a lot of his favorite bands. And I had, again, I had met him at a festival that we played at six months ago and he said, we'd love to have you come. Um, Steve Wynn is going to be playing and Steve is somebody who I backed up a lot in a, in a number of different lineups. Um, people might know him from dream syndicate and, and a bunch of other projects that he's done. But, uh, so I was ostensibly brought to kind of back him up, but there were a lot of other really cool bands um, playing on the bill, um, many of whom I ended up sitting in with as a result of just going there and hitting it off with people and then saying like, oh, hey, you're a keyboard player and you know how to learn songs quickly. So that's uh, that could come in handy. So I don't know, like Danielson was there and uh, Ladybug Transistor and... Um, and Hamish Kilgour from The Clean and Tiny Ruins and uh, I'm trying to remember who else. Oh, Jeffrey Lewis, who was on your show recently. Um, yeah. He was there. So that was cool to like, because I'd never met him before, but I'd been a fan. So it was, it was nice to to make a connection with him. Uh, and, it, and then and, uh, and there were some other Norwegian groups there. And it was just, uh, it was an awesome time. But yeah, my, my touring is, um, I mean, it's limited by the, 
the Red Sox schedule, but it's also just kind of limited by like uh, real life. Like I have a part-time office job. I work in the library for the Harvard music department and you know, they give me time off up to a point, but, uh, but I got to go to work. So, you know, pay the bills and get the health insurance. So, um, I tour when I can usually ends up being maybe four or five times a year for about a week at a time. It's rarely anything more than that. And on the one hand, that's pretty amazing and pretty awesome that I get to do that. Um, on the other hand, uh, you know, there are times when I wish that I had time to be on the road more cause I, cause I love going on the road and it's something that, um, I'm a bit of a late bloomer in that regard. I never, I never did a tour until I was like, I don't know, 38 or something. And most of the musicians who I tour with, they started touring when they were like 19. Um, yeah. and they've been doing it for a long, long, long time. So, um, so I was like an old rookie, you know, and I had a lot right. to learn yeah. and I still yeah. have a lot to learn, but you know, but I've been learning over the handful of years, uh, that I've been doing it now. So, yeah, that's, that's sort of always a grass is always greener kind of situation. I think, um, you know, I, I think a lot about, um, that the, the trajectory of, you know, I, I'm, in my early twenties and I've been like trying to, you know, sort of get a, a, a touring, you know, a regular touring rotation integrated, mm-hmm. you know, into my, into my life. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it's, it's an interesting thing to see like bands that have done what you were just saying, been touring since they were super young and, and maybe that's all they've done since then. Um, but then there's a lot of bands who maybe did that. And then at some point it's sort of like, you know, curtailed and, and, and something else sort of has taken, you know, taken hold of, of, of a bigger chunk of, of their life. Yeah. So being able to kind of have your, you know, your, your feet in both, worlds is something that appeals to me more and more like just the thought of even having you know like i i do i do web design you know yeah. so it's like the thought of being able to be a uh, 50% of my time is spent at the computer and 50% of my time is spent on the road I, I think that's kind of a cool thing and something that you know maybe in this day and age is is more and more feasible uh and i don't know maybe uh something to aspire to uh yeah i think it's i think it's more feasible and and more sort of attainable or whatever you know maybe the trick is just kind of keeping it all in balance that's that's what i've been kind of trying to figure it out, figure out in recent years in terms of doing the baseball games and doing the library job and doing the touring i mean for many years i i worked full time in libraries um, eventually I got to a point where between that and baseball and wanting to do some of this, you know, touring and recording, there just, there weren't enough hours in the day. So I was like, well, I'll, you know, I'll see if the library will let me reduce my hours and I'll take a pay cut, you know, in order to, um, have time to do some other things that I love to do and, and try to find that balance. And, you know, I'm sort of constantly, uh, recalibrating, I guess. But I think, yeah, you know, when I was your age, you know, when I finished college in 94, I didn't really see for myself, I didn't see a path for like being a working musician. Um, so, you know, I went and got an office job and I still played a lot. I didn't play out, but I played at home, um, like every night. And the thing that came out of that was like, I became a pretty good player. Um, Although just solo, you know, I didn't took much longer after that to figure out how to how to be a good ensemble player and how to play with a band and all that kind of stuff. But Mm -hmm. um, but I guess it's just that, you know, everyone's um, I don't know, everyone's path on this stuff is different and and everyone's skill set is different. You know, like you were talking about that you wish you could do the thing that I know how to do, which is to like learn a bunch of songs quickly and you know, I value having that skill, but there's like, there's skills I don't have that I wish I had, you know, I'm not good at reading music. I'm not good at writing music. Um, I wish I was, it's like, there's, there's only so much you can do and, and 
only so much that you can cultivate. So you try to prioritize what's important. And I think you're right. I think we're in an era right now where people can um, have more control over, you know, how they want to craft it, at least in a way that makes it rewarding, if not necessarily in a way that makes it, um, you know, popular. I mean, it's still a mystery to me how anybody can like, uh, make a lot of money, you know, playing music. <laughs> yeah. <but laughs> yeah, no, I, I, I question that so much just, you know, looking at bands like sort of the types of bands that we've been talking about in that, yeah. kind of in, you know, indie world, like an Eric Bachman or a drive by trucker, you know, any of those types of bands, it's like, I I I wish that I could be a fly on the wall sometimes, you know, in in their accountant's office just to like it's just so curious to me, you know, how do how are these bands doing this? Yeah, I mean it's I'm curious as well and it's something that again, you know, because I came to the game late, I never really had a lot of exposure to that side of it. And now I have a little bit and I try to educate myself. Um for a long time I worked in a library at a law school. And that was kind of helpful for me in terms of learning a lot about um, uh, copyright issues and some of the business issues and, you know, some of the legal issues. And I could apply some of that stuff to the, um, to my practice in the music business. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm always very fascinated by that, by hearing bands have those conversations about, you um, you know, whether it's something like, um, you know, just owning the use of your stuff versus some other entity owning it and being able to license it, or whether it's, you know, publishing revenue or, you know, starting your own, you know, company that, that makes the t-shirts or just whatever the thing is like, um, it's interesting to me to see how people are sort of trying to find different ways, um, to, to maybe make a little money with their, you know, with this thing that they're trying to have either as an expressive outlet or as a career or both. Um, you know, there's a, there's a million different ways to do it. So that's on the one hand, it's empowering because you can sort of like pick the way you want to do it and, and set that course and be in control of that. Um, on the other hand, it's like, there's, there's just a ton of uncertainty around every decision, I think. Yeah, no, exactly. And that's, you know, I see, it seems like there's more and more, you know, musicians who are, you know, close, more like middle-aged kind of musicians who are, who are even just now, it seems like undertaking these different avenues, like opening coffee shops or, you know, just. Yeah, know, right. I was actually, I was reading just, like just minutes before you called me this evening, I was reading about like, Willie Nelson is, I mean, this, this should surprise no one, but I guess he's going to like, like, he's going to like have his own marijuana product that he sells in Colorado or something. Oh, you know? wow. <laughs> <laughs> That's not where I expected you to go with that. I... <laughs> well, no, but it's, just, I think it's pertinent, you know, as you're talking. Oh, about no, no. It. Yeah. And I... obviously he's somebody who's like, you know, super well established. Um, and, uh, but it's just a funny thing. It's like, yes, yeah. this is, you know, this is, you can do this, you know, if you yeah, want to. Yeah. Yeah, no, that is that is really interesting. I I was uh the person I had in my mind when I said that was um that guy Joel Plaskett. I don't know if you're familiar with him at all. I don't think so. He, he's a Canadian musician that's, you know, pretty popular as as far as I'm concerned. Uh-huh. Um who just yeah, just opened a coffee shop like sort of record like vinyl lounge or something like okay. that. Okay. So I was kind of expecting you to to have an example like that <laughs> the, the willie nelson pot no that was uh, that me. was the one that that popped into my head i just happened to know well because i got this email saying uh you know i just i get all those concert listing emails and i saw yeah. that, that willie was coming and i was like oh cool let me check and see if that conflicts with a red sox game because if it doesn't i'd like to go to the show and of yeah. course my luck being what it is on that one it, it conflicts with the red sox game so i won't be able to uh, see the show but then when i clicked on it it said it was like press release, Willie Nelson, you know, <laughs> to begin selling weed legally, you know. Well, that's nice. I, I'm I'm sure he's been looking forward to that for a long time. So I, sus I suspect he has. Yeah, <laughs> he deserves it. All right. Uh, I wanted to talk a little more about, or 
not more because we haven't talked about it yet but uh so just the the credits you've listed on you have listed on your twitter we've gone through a couple of them uh-huh. uh i wanted to talk about uh the jim's big ego baseball project split squad those are th- three other bands that you play in or have played in yeah those are the uh, those are the three like active bands that i'm actively regularly you know playing with as a sort of as a full-fledged uh, or nearly full fledged, depending on my availability, uh, you know, performing, recording, touring member. Mm-hmm. Um, Jim's Big Ego is a local band in Boston. They've been around for about 20 years. I've been with them for about seven or eight. Um, we haven't been super active the last year or two just because we've all been involved in different projects. But this is a band that I was a fan of for a really long time. There's a guy named Jim, Jim Infantino. He's the namesake of Jim's Big Ego. He's the front man, he does most of the writing, most of the lead singing amazing writer amazing performer and i was a fan for a long time and kind of got to know him and they were a trio they didn't have a keyboard player but they asked me to um record a couple songs and they asked me to sit in and then they asked me to join the group so i was quite thrilled to do it um and i love playing with that group and we do a fun show we haven't done it in a while but i'm hoping maybe we'll get it going again um that's kind of like a fortune telling show where we have um uh i don't know what it is maybe like 60 songs um that are uh, um, 60 of our songs that are uh, selected at random by people in the crowd and they come up and they, they ask a question, you know, regarding their, something they would like to know the answer to. It's usually a fortune telling thing or like, a, you know, should I, people tend to ask a lot of questions that are like, you know, should I quit my job? Should I get married? Should I move out of state? Should I go back to school? These kinds of things. Mm-hmm. Um, and then the songs will get selected at random and then we'll play the songs. And then we have a, a host of the show who will um, answer the questions by way of an, interpreting the lyrics to the song that we just played. So um, it's a fun, interesting sort of, I don't know, like theatrical cabaret interactive kind of thing. Um, it's called the ego and the Oracle and we really like doing it. Um, the other groups, the, uh, the split squad is, um, uh, it's kind of an amalgam. I, I hesitate to say super group, but maybe that's what some people would call it of just different people from different bands. It's, um, Eddie Munoz, who was the guitarist in the Plimsolls and Keith Strang, who's been the guitarist in the Flesh Tones for like 40 years now. And, um, and Clem Burke, who's a drummer in Blondie and a whole bunch of other groups. And, uh, and this fellow, Mike Giblin, um, who's a, singer and bass player in Pennsylvania who has played in a ton of cool bands. Um, and we, you know, when we're not busy with our other projects, we get together and perform and record and put out a record and we're working on another one. And it's a really, really fun band to play with. Um, I'm, you know, slightly in disbelief at my good fortune for being asked to join them, but, um, but I love playing with them. And a uh, baseball project is, also kind of like an amalgam or like super group type of group. Um, And the deal with that group is that all the songs are about baseball. So it's all original songs on the subject of baseball. I think we have about 70 so far and we're working on a bunch more, Mm -hmm. Um, three LPs and then various other releases. Um, And most notably um, Mike Mills from REM is a member of the group. Um, Peter Buck also from REM is sort of a part-time member of the group. And then um, Scott McCoy and Linda Pittman and Steve Matt is always uh, super fun. And I think, you know, it's it's maybe primarily through those folks in recent years that I've ended up, you know, meeting a lot of these other indie rock folks and being on these bills and being on these festivals um, and sitting in with groups because those are, you know, people who have been playing for over 30 years, you know, and have played every size and shape and stripe of venue that you could imagine and just have kind of gotten to know everyone. Um, and from what I can tell have really sort of prioritized like, um, you know, working with, you know, the kinds of people they want to work with people who are creative and interesting and, and friendly. Um, so there's a very, uh, you know, when, when working with them and with, and with other people they've introduced me to, it's always just very um, congenial and fun and friendly and nobody's got egos or attitudes. Nobody's a jerk. Everyone's just like really awesome to work with. So I feel, I feel fortunate for that as well. What, what, what sort of uh, 
what kind of schedule does that band keep? Like, do they tour at all? Yeah, they do. That band keeps a, uh, I don't know how I would describe the schedule. It's, it's just because like everyone's so busy. Everyone in that band is in multiple other bands. So yeah. it's a matter of carving out the time to all get together. So typically it's been like every two to three years, there'll be some period of months where it's on the front burner for everyone. And it's a focal point and everyone has carved out the time for this to be like, okay, now we're going to write and record this new album. And then once it's out there, you know, we're going to try to promote it. We're going to try to do as many shows as we can. Um, they get a big kick out of um, touring during baseball season and getting to see ball games as part kind of routing the tours around like, Hey, which like, when does Cleveland have a day game? Cause that's the night we want to play in Cleveland. Cause then we'll go to the game in the afternoon yeah. and then we'll go play the show at night. Um, and they've also ended up just kind of meeting, uh, you know, like some ball players and people who work for the team. And all of a sudden so the team will call and say like, Hey, why don't you come sing the national anthem for the game? Or why don't you throw out the ceremonial first pitch? Or they've ended up doing a lot of that kind of stuff, which, um, has just sort of been like a fun side thing that's, that's come out of it, but it has indulged the, the baseball geek, um, in all of them. So, um, uh, yeah, so there are bursts of like high levels of activity with that group, you know, and then downtime, although it's downtime only because they're, you know, because so, they're working on other stuff, you know, there's no, sure, yeah. there's no downtime in any of their lives individually, just right. maybe in the, the project itself, maybe takes a breather while other projects get some attention. It's been fun and it's grown into this cool thing. And I was lucky enough to get brought into the fold. Um, it's, uh, I don't know, it's fun. And I, and what I've seen is like, I mean, the, the evidence is, is entirely anecdotal, but it seems like, um, a lot of rock people are kind of like coming out of the closet as base, as big baseball fans um, in as kind of as a result of this project. Like I think for a long time it was sort of, you know, it was uncool if you were a, um, if you were a rock person to kind of admit like, yes, I really love baseball and I read the box scores every morning. And um, But they, you know, Scott and Steve through these songs they wrote, they kind of made it safe for, um, for a lot of people to say, yeah, I love it. And, and as a result of that, like I've met a bunch of, you know, terrific musicians who I've been a fan of who say, Oh yeah, I really love baseball. And you know, it's nice to meet you. And it's cool that you do this, this organ music at Fenway. And, um, so, yeah, I mean, I just, in the last week have you know, just kind of listened through the, like the three records that there are. And, uh, yeah, I mean, it's clearly there's a lot of, uh, I mean, I don't know how much research they had to do or if this was all stuff that they, I'm sure they all had knowledge of it uh, to, to some extent. But, I mean, there's a lot of pretty specific, you know, stories or information being conveyed in those songs that, you know, they're clearly not slouching as far as that's concerned. Yeah, and I think in some cases there is some some reading and some research involved where they'll, go, you know, they'll have an idea for what they want to write about, but then they, they might look to accounts of the stories you know, historical accounts to kind of try to flesh out the, um, the songs a bit. And then other times there may be artistic license. I know Steve wrote this amazing song, um, about this guy who, you know, was in the big leagues for one day. Um, and he got hurt during warmups <laughs> and then he got sent uh -huh. back down and he's the only player ever to be in the big leagues and never actually play. <laughs> and so there's not a whole lot known or written about this guy. So Steve kind of had to imagine like what must it have been like for him combined with the fact that his brother was a very successful major league player who played for 20 years and is in the hall of fame. And what must wow. that be like for the dynamic between the two brothers and the families and all this kind of stuff. Um, so he speculated, um, but he wrote a beautiful song and somehow like the song was brought to the attention of the guy who, who was the subject of it. And he, um, and he wrote Steve a really nice letter saying, thank you for writing this song. It's a beautiful song. My family and I are, are very touched by it. So, you know, as, as to how accurate it was that I don't, you know, how much he captured the, the, the sentiment, I don't know, but, it, but on some level he, he must have, you know, cause sure. it struck a chord with the, with the subject of the song. Josh, we, uh, 
we pretty much nailed like a, a, a tight flat hour right here. Um, I really enjoyed talking with you. Uh, Likewise. Is there, is there anything else uh, sort of within this realm that that's worth discussing? Do uh, I don't know. We, we covered an awful lot, I guess. Yeah. Uh, no, I think we're good, but, um, but if any of your listeners have questions or comments or feedback or any kind of follow up, um, you know, find me on Twitter. I try to make myself, uh, as accessible and, and conversational on there as I can. So rise up, you lonely wanderers, rise up, you hungry people. The hurricane is coming. The land will soon be flooded. The past is dead and over. Rise up now, claim your freedom. You are the sleeping giant. Arise, arise, arise. Do not beg for your salvation from preachers, kings, or masters. The people hold the power. Arise and claim your freedom. The wealthy enjoy services only at your acquiescence. Only while you stay in darkness. Arise, arise, arise. International. Mm-hmm. While politicals divide us, they demand their compensation. They should pray we don't refuse them. Arise and claim your freedom. The powerful and wealthy, they are only human beings. On earth, we all. expense of all our children rise and claim your freedom they are frightened by our numbers and by our interdependence and rightfully they should be rise 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 who's in the end freedom will be international With purchases or vain overconsumption. Do not isolate your spirit. Arise and claim your freedom. Your TV and your radio seek to keep you in your slumber. Step out into the sunlight. Arise, arise, arise. Rise up, you lonely wanderers. Rise up, you hungry people. The hurricane is coming. Land will soon be flooded. The past is dead and over. Rise up now, claim your freedom. You are the sleeping giant. Rise, rise, rise. In the end, freedom will be. Yes, in. International. All right, that song was called International, and that is off of the Jim's Big Ego LP entitled Free. Josh plays piano and organ on that track. Uh, thanks, Josh, for sending those over for us, and thanks for talking with me. I hope uh, you all enjoyed this conversation. And if you ever find yourself at a Red Sox game, uh, send a tweet over to Josh in the organ booth and see if he'll accommodate uh, your request. Uh, just don't don't blame me if he doesn't play it, but it'll be worth a shot. Uh, follow Spark and Fizz on Facebook, on Twitter, and on Instagram. 
uh, follow me on Twitter at Jacob C. McKelvey. Um, reach out to any of those handles, any of those accounts on whatever platform. If you have any any comments about the show, if you want to, I don't know, make a suggestion or tell us what you like about the show. I don't know. In fact, if you want to tell someone what you like about the show, why don't you go over and tell iTunes? Leave a review on iTunes, and, uh, well, there's nothing you can win right now. Our contest is over, but you'll, you'll, uh, you'll have the satisfaction of knowing. Just do it. Just, just leave a review. Just leave a review on iTunes. It'll just take a minute. All right, we'll be back in two weeks. Uh, Thanks so much for listening. We have some exciting guests coming up in the next few episodes, so uh, I hope you'll come back for those. Thanks a lot, and we'll talk to you soon.